I have been looking forward to today since May 1st. Some of that looking forward has been with enthusiasm. Some of that looking forward has been with excitement. And some of it has been building in anxiousness. Uh, some, someone might need to check to see whether blood is flowing back into my wife's hand because I was gripping it so tightly. Um, I've also heard, by the way, that uh, cameras add some things to people. I've heard that the cameras add 10 pounds. I'm hoping it adds six inches. <laughs> my friends and colleagues, as we begin another school year together, I want to express to you my deep gratitude for each and every one of you, all 4,500 of you, who constitute the remarkable workforce of Brigham Young University. It is a joy for me to labor with faculty, staff, and administrative colleagues who have a clear sense of our university mission and who tirelessly work to fulfill it. Each of you labors daily to help our students become what prophets have said they are destined to become. Of that destiny, President Spencer W. Kimball said this, quote, I am both hopeful and expectant that out of this university there will rise brilliant stars in drama, literature, music, sculpture, painting, science, and in all the scholarly graces, close quote. President Kimball hoped BYU would be a refining host for many such stars. Much of that refining comes as our students rub shoulders with you. Thank you for being who you are and doing what you do to help our students fulfill President Kimball's prophetic vision. Few figures in all of human history are more impressive, impressive than the prophet Mormon. Mormon lived through, indeed he actively participated in, a season of horrific and constant war. Quote, a continual scene of wickedness and abominations, he reflected, has been before mine eyes ever since I have been sufficient to behold the ways of man. And yet, despite the terror of his times, Mormon remained unwaveringly loyal to the Savior and unbreakable in his faithfulness to his covenants. He remained a peaceful follower of Christ, and to his dying day, he testified of faith, hope, and charity, the pure love of Christ. But what was Mormon's secret? How did he remain faithful while his society careened towards annihilation? How did he retain hope in the face of widespread despair? How did he cultivate charity in the face of total war? Part of the answer can be found in the spiritual gift that Mormon received and developed when he was very young. Mormon was just 10 years old when Amaron defined, identified him as the future custodian of the Nephite's sacred records. To the 10-year-old Mormon, Amaron said this, quote, I perceive that thou art a sober child, and are quick to observe. Therefore, when ye are about 20 and four years old, I would that ye should remember that ye have observed concerning this people. And behold, ye shall engrave upon the plates of Nephi all the things that ye have observed concerning this people. I take my text today from Amaron's charge to Mormon. In doing so, I follow the example of Elder David A. Bednar, who, in an unforgettable 2005 devotional, said this about the verses I've just quoted, quote, Please note that the root word observed is used three times in these verses. And Mormon, even in his youth, is described as being quick to observe. As you study and learn and grow during your time as a university student, I hope you are learning about and becoming quick to observe. Your future success and happiness will, in large me measure, be determined by this spiritual capacity. Please consider the significance of this important spiritual gift, said Elder Bednar. As used in the scriptures, the word observe has two primary uses. One use denotes to look or to see or to notice. The second use of the word observe suggests to obey or to keep. Thus, when we are quick to observe, we promptly look or notice and obey. Both of these fundamental elements, looking and obeying, are essential to being quick to observe. And the prophet Mormon is an impressive example of this gift in action, close quote. I believe that our work at BYU will be immeasurably enhanced and our capacity to bless our students' lives will be greatly multiplied if we can receive and cultivate 
the spiritual gift of being quick to observe. Today, I want to highlight six areas in which we can all benefit from this lesser known gift. One, mission aligned hiring. Two, inspiring learning. Three, our student successes. Four, the CES honor code, including its dress and grooming standards. Five, leaning into our unique mission. And six, heeding the words of prophets. Let me address each of these areas in turn. I reiterate today what my predecessors have said. The most important decisions we make under my tenure as president are the people we hire. The people we hire will be role models to whom our students look for examples of combining professional excellence with spiritual commitment. They will spend time with our students, significant time, both in and out of classrooms. Our students need models who understand the excellence in one's chosen field and faithfully keeping sacred covenants are not mutually exclusive. We must never subscribe to the false dichotomy that we can be either excellent or we can be faithful. No, we can and we must be excellent, not in spite of our loyalty to the gospel of Jesus Christ, but directly and precisely because of it. We will anchor our excellence and devotion to, our, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our spiritual mission pr provides the strengthening leaven for our academic mission. Speaking from this rostrum two years ago, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland stressed the importance of being true to BYU's spiritual mission. He said, it seems clear to me in my 73 years of loving it that BYU will become an educational Mount Everest only to the degree to which it embraces its uniqueness, its singularity. We could mimic every other university in the world until we got a bloody nose in the effort and the world would still say BYU who? No, we must have the will to be different to stand alone if necessary. Being a university second to none in its role primarily as an undergraduate teaching institution that is unequivocally true to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In that same message, Elder Holland declared, I will go to my grave pleading that this institution not only stands, but stands unquestionably committed to its unique academic mission and to the church that it sponsors, that sponsors it. As president, I commit to do everything in my power to answer this apostolic plea. We do and we will stand unquestionably committed to our inspired mission and to our sponsoring church. We will never waver in that commitment, not on my watch. That commitment will require us to be quick to observe in our hiring decisions. I am profoundly grateful to all of you for your prayerful attention to hiring individuals who strive for excellence in their field and devotion in their discipleship. Thank you for adding to our ranks who we recognized earlier today, who are intentional about strengthening our students' testimonies and building our students' faith. We are striving to hire colleagues who are committed to what President Worthen called inspiring learning. As you know, President Worthen has recently become the inaugural Distinguished Faculty Fellow for the Wheatley Institute's Constitutional Government Initiative and a visiting professor at the Yale Law School. We are eternally grateful to President and Sister Worthen for their heroic contributions to advancing BYU's mission. We love them, and we are excited for this next chapter of their journey. As Kevin and Peggy ride off, at least temporarily, into the New Haven sunset, some have wondered whether we will continue to emphasize inspiring learning. The answer to that question is a resounding yes. Of course we will. We have no choice. Remember that inspiring learning was President Worthen's shorthand notation for the heart of our mission and aims. As long as we are true to our mission and aims, we will promote inspiring learning. Like, many, like me, many of you remember when President Worthen introduced the phrase inspiring learning at a university conference six years ago with, a, with characteristic clarity, President Worthen taught this. Quote, when I use the term inspiring learning, I have in mind both meanings of the word inspiring. I hope we will inspire our students to learn, and I hope that learning leads to inspiration. When both things happen, inspiring learning occurs, and we can then know we are on the right track to achieve the core goals 
set forth in our mission statement, close quote. For six years, President Worthen's message, which you can find in volume one of Envisioning BYU, has led to inspiration and revelation. I hope we will all return to it often. In light of President Worthen's powerful message, there is no need to reinvent the wheel and no reason to deploy new terminology to describe our aspiration for our students. We already have a winning strategy for engaging with students in inspiring ways, both in and out of the classroom. But what does that winning strategy look like? It looks like dedicated faculty guiding students on study abroad trips through which they are immersed in countries and cultures different from our own, and during which they see gospel principles reinforced in those different settings. It looks like projects that address societal problems through principles of self-reliance and sustainable health. It looks like incorporating gospel questions into research collaborations between faculty and students. It looks like staff and administrative employees modeling for student employees a life of faith in the workplace. Last year, thanks to your extraordinary efforts and commitment, more than 12,000 students reported an inspiring learning experience. Now, I believe that number is higher than 12,000, but that's the number from whom we've received a report. We know from numerous studies that students who participate in high impact educational practices and inspiring learning practices are high impact practices, are likely to succeed in college, more likely to succeed in college. We are committed to increasing the proportion of students who participate in these high impact experiential learning opportunities and inspiring learning opportunities. I invite you to work to become quick to observe students who need an inspiring learning experience and to find ways to provide such experiences. During this year's resource planning exercise, we learned about many incredible examples of inspiring learning from the past year. In both academic units and in academic support units, we saw example after example of campus colleagues who are quick to observe. In one of the most difficult tasks of my short time as president, I have had to choose only one example to share with you today. We're in Ecuador. We're working on a BYU global engineering outreach project. In Ecuador, they have prosthetic clinics, but it's really expensive. We wanted to create a process where they could make their own prosthetics. We brought a process. We brought a design. It was incredibly motivating for our entire team to know that this would ultimately go to people not able to financially provide for a prosthetic. One of the patients said, having this foot shell makes me feel like I have my own foot again. You can't get any better response than that. Yo estoy muy contento porque gracias a los estudiantes de la Universidad BYU, las personas de mi país van a poder tener una ayuda de una prótesis a un precio muy económico. BYU has changed my life by giving me an education that brings me closer to God. The things that we're learning can so directly help others and improve the world. I love this example of a student who saw a need as a missionary and who worked closely with other students and a faculty mentor to respond to that need. This example illustrates how students who understand their identity as children of God, children of the covenant, and disciples of Jesus Christ instinctively recognize their covenantal responsibility to help their fellow human beings who share that primary identity. The students in the video exemplify core principles of inspiring learning, including intentionality and reflection. These principles distinguish inspiring learning at BYU from experiential learning practices elsewhere. They reflect our unique mission to foster the balanced development of the whole person, or as President Kimball put it, the eternal person. The mission of this university is to help our students succeed temporally and spiritually in school and in life, in time and in eternity. Unfortunately, many of our students come to us without all the advantages that might prepare them for success at BYU. I know this well because I was such a student when I first arrived on this campus almost 35 years ago. That dates me. One of the most challenging parts of my freshman experience as a first-generation college student was all of the unknown unknowns. The campus seemed huge, and there was so much that I did not know about BYU. I didn't know where to go for help. 
I didn't know what my place was in the mission of BYU. I didn't know where I fit in with my peers. In other words, I lacked three things I needed to succeed. I lacked resources, a sense of mission, and connection. Thankfully, I was blessed by BYU employees, including a young law professor named Kevin Worthen, who were quick to observe my need and help me find my way. Many of the freshmen who enter our doors this fall lacked the same things I lacked. Resources, an understanding of BYU's unique mission, and a sense of connectedness to fellow students. Today, I am pleased to announce an, an inspiring initiative designed to help equip all our students with all three of these things. Over the past year, we have piloted a new course called BYU Foundations for Student Success that will connect incoming students with a peer network and a faculty mentor, orient them to the resources available on campus, and above all, instill in them a profound sense of our inspired mission. The students who have participated in this course thus far have reported amazing experiences. I want to share a video that describes just a few of those experiences. I remember going to my first class and it was in the auditorium with hundreds of students and I was like, how am I supposed to ever meet anyone or make friends? In my junior college, I didn't make a lot of friends because I didn't have that sense of community there that I really didn't know that I needed until I came here. I think coming in as a freshman can be kind of scary. You don't really know what you're doing. And so it's really nice having the familiar faces to help each other succeed. This new class is an opportunity to get a jump start into what it's like to be a part of the BYU community. And so a huge aspect of it is building belonging. And so really showing the students why they're here at BYU and why this is a unique opportunity. We talked a lot about what it means to belong and as freshmen, as children of God. Because BYU has that combination of spiritual and secular learning, it's such a unique place to invite the Lord's work into our education and into the rest of our lives. I think this class helped students see the importance of connection. The assignment that had the biggest impact was to go as a group to an event on campus. Our class made a group chat and anytime that someone was doing something, the whole class was invited. We had a study group together, we went to devotional together, we focus on building a Zion community here, and then other things like resources on campus to help you with your academics or your mental health and how to be a disciple scholar. Knowing the aims and the mission of BYU, it really gives motivation and a reason for your learning. Our professor also taught us to lean on Christ, to rely on Christ for the things that we feel we're failing in or the things that we can do better in, to always rely on Christ and to make Him the center of our lives. God really blessed me to be in these classes. They help students to feel like they're a part of a community and that they mean something to help them find their light. It's really nice just knowing that you are here for a reason. At the end of the semester, we decided to have a group picture together that we called our family photo because we have that bond. If everyone had an opportunity to be in a class like this, I think BYU will be changed forever. I love that video. I love the experience our students had there. And I am pleased to announce that beginning winter semester 2024, BYU Foundations for Student Success will be required of all newly admitted students. I express profound gratitude for those who have developed this course, prepared for its rollout, and volunteered to teach it. These colleagues have been quick to observe our students' needs and swift to respond. They are eager to minister to students, experiencing what the rabbi Dr. Ari Berman has called a crisis of meaning. In his memorable message about being quick to observe, Elder Bednar praised young people who are quick to observe prophetic teachings, including prophetic teachings about personal conduct, dress, and grooming. As a university community, we remain profoundly committed to the CES Honor Code and to its dress and grooming principles and standards. In keeping with patterns that youth in the church are now very familiar with, we have recently released an updated ecclesiastical endorsement procedure 
and updated CES honor code, including principles and standards for dress and grooming. I feel impressed to say a word or two about each of these updates. In his first devotional message as BYU president, Elder Holland noted that BYU is, as it were, a school on a mission. And like the missionaries we send out into the world, we at BYU need to look different from the world. Our dress and appearance should reflect our unique mission. As we considered updating the honor code, we tried to understand the hearts and minds of our students. A team from the commissioner's office conducted focus groups at several CES institutions, including here at BYU. Without exception, these students were enthusiastic about proposed changes to the ecclesiastical endorsement process and the honor code, honor code including dress and grooming provisions. Students were especially attracted by the prospect of principle-based revisions that would provide greater consistency across our CES institutions. New ecclesiastical endorsement questions were developed to better align the endorsement process with their ecclesiastical jurisdictions. Ecclesiastical leaders can now focus on the ecclesiastical aspects of qualifying to attend BYU. The revised interview questions closely track the standard temple recommend, but they also accommodate the fact that some of our young people might be in various stages of their testimony development. The questions regard regarding testimony development focus on striving towards deeper testimony rather than on whether or not one has a testimony at all. Aligning the questions asked by bishops and stake presidents with, more closely with their ecclesiastical responsibilities will bolster their unique ministry. In addition to refining the ecclesiastical endorsement process, we have also codified language within the Honor Code that has been an uncodified appendage to the Honor Code since 2020. Many institutions of higher education have codes of conduct that prescribe standards of acceptable behavior. I love the distinctive nature of our honor code, beginning with its name. It is an honor code because we believe that its principles and standards foster an environment marked by honor, integrity, morality, and consideration of others. The honor code thus helps us accomplish our spiritual mission by engendering an atmosphere conducive to that mission. Brigham Young University exists to provide an education in an atmosphere consistent with the ideals and principles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That atmosphere is created and preserved by a community of faculty, administration, staff, and students who voluntarily commit to conduct their lives in accordance with the principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ and who strive to maintain the highest standards in their personal conduct regarding honor, integrity, morality, and consideration of others. The Honor Code's updated dress and grooming principles and standards, which have been influenced by feedback from student focus groups, are grounded in core principles. Consistent with those principles, every student, faculty member, administrative or staff employee, and volunteer on this campus agrees through their dress and grooming choices to one, represent the Savior Jesus Christ, the church, and the church educational system. Two, preserve an inspiring environment without distraction or disruption, where covenants are kept in a spirit of unity so that the Holy Ghost can teach truth. Three, promote modesty, cleanliness, neatness, and restraint in dress and grooming. And four, maintain an elevated standard distinctive to educational institutions of the Church of Jesus Christ. These are powerful principles, and our students are confident that when dress and grooming guidelines are rooted in enduring principles, understanding and commitment will certainly follow, even if it takes some time for that understanding and commitment to take hold. Now, as your president, I commit to uphold these principles. I am today asking you to commit to uphold these principles for yourselves. It is a privilege to represent the Savior, His church, and its educational system. Cultivating a learning environment free from distraction requires concentrated effort from all of us. The impact of our efforts is magnified 
when we invite the Holy Ghost to be part of our learning environment. As President Nelson has prophetically declared, in coming days it will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding, directing, comforting, and constant influence of the Holy Ghost. Our educational goals cannot be achieved if they are unaided by the influence of the Holy Ghost. And if ye receive not the Spirit, the Lord decrees, ye shall not teach. We are asking each and every one of you, all of our employees, whether you're faculty, staff, or administrative, to help teach these principles. Obviously, the best place to start is by, by being quick to observe these principles in our own dress and grooming decisions. We ask you to apply these principles and simplified standards in your own personal lives. For most of you, this will involve no change at all. For some of you, it might require some adjustment. Beyond personal observance, we are asking each of you to help reinforce these principles with our students. Students frequently justify noncompliance by muttering, well, nobody ever said anything to me about it. Although the absence of a reminder does not excuse a lapse of integrity, we should be more willing to encourage one another in our commitment to live the principles and standards we've all agreed to. Will you join me in being both quick to adopt these principles and standards in your own life and quick to observe students and other campus community members who might need a reminder about a principle or expectation in their dress and grooming? I realize that this may not be easy and that some of these discussions will require practice and training and sensitivity. Kevin Utt, director of the BYU Honor Code Office, has expressed a willingness, along with his team, to discuss with departments and other campus units the most effective way to teach and reinforce these principles. Kevin and his team have experience, wisdom, and understanding of how best to help students and others internalize these principles. I commend the Honor Code staff to you for help in your internal discussions, especially those discuss discussions which may be somewhat sensitive in nature. When a principle-based revision of For the Strength of Youth was shared with the worldwide church, Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf shared wise counsel with parents of the rising generation. I hope it won't detract too much from his powerful message if I take the liberty of modifying it to apply it to our BYU employees. God has given BYU employees the sacred duty to nurture our students in love and righteousness, to provide for their physical and spiritual needs, and to teach them to observe the commandments of God. That's enough to keep even the best parents awake at night. My message to all BYU employees is this, the Lord loves you, he is with you, he stands beside you, he is your strength in guiding your students to make righteous choices. Accept this privilege and responsibility courageously and joyfully. Don't delegate this source of heavenly blessings to anyone else. Within the framework of gospel values and principles, you are the ones to guide your students in the details of daily decisions. Help your students build faith in Jesus Christ, love his gospel and his church, and prepare for a lifetime of righteous choices. Elder Uchtdorf's prophetic guidance was to empower parents who hold the primary responsibility for helping our young people implement a principle-based approach to making righteous choices. I hope we too will be courageous and joyful as we accept Elder Uchtdorf's invitation with our students. As we do so, we will assist our students in their commitment to these powerful principles. Next, may I invite us this year to strive to become quick to observe the many facets of our uniqueness as an institution. Having observed these unique features, I invite us all to lean into them. In this respect, I again quote from President Kimball. There are many ways in which BYU can tower above other universities, not simply because of the size of its student body or the, its beautiful campus, but because of the unique light BYU can send forth into the educational world. Your light must have a special glow, for while you will do many things in the programs of this university that are done elsewhere, these same things can and must be done better here than others do them. You will also do some special things here that are left undone by other institutions." Close quote. 
This will be true not in spite of our uniqueness, but because of it. At BYU, we unabashedly declare that belief enhances inquiry, study amplifies faith, and revelation leads to deeper understanding. The principles of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ, as taught by living prophets and apostles, anchor our common mission and form the essence of what makes the BYU experience so unique. We at BYU can tap into divine help for solutions that do not merely scratch the surface of the problems of our day, but address the substance and roots of those problems. Finally, I want to close with an invitation similar to the invitation extended by Elder Bednar. Look to the words of prophets, seers, and revelators, and find ways to incorporate their teachings into our individual and our professional lives. At BYU, we have the unique opportunity to be governed by a board of education composed of prophets, seers, and revelators. In those meetings, it is regularly confirmed that Russell M. Nelson is truly a prophet of God. I want you as members of our campus community to know that I know he is a prophet. I also know that the members of the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles one of whom is with us today, our prophets, seers, and revelators. So my invitation to you today is to be quick to observe when he speaks and endeavor to observe what he teaches into your daily lives. Today, I want to draw your attention to teachings from two prophets that seem particularly applicable as we begin a new semester in an increasingly polarized world. Elder D. Todd Christofferson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles stressed the importance of unity in April 2023 General Conference. He said, We are too diverse and at times too discordant to be able to come together as one on any other basis or under any other name. Only in Jesus Christ can we truly become one. Becoming one in Christ happens one by one. We each begin with ourselves. Elder Christofferson then urged us to press forward towards such unity imperfectly, but determinedly. When he said, and when we fall short, Christ, by his atonement, has given us the gift of repentance and the opportunity to try again. If individually we each put on Christ, then together we can hope to become one, as Paul said, the body of Christ. To put on Christ certainly includes making his first and great commandment our first and greatest commitment. And if we love God, we will keep his commandments. Unity with our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ grows as we heed the second commandment, inextricably connected to the first, to love our others as ourselves. And I suppose even, even more perfect unity would obtain among us if we followed the Savior's higher and holier expression of this second commandment, to love one another, not only as we love ourselves, but as he loved us. In sum, it is every man seeking the interest of his neighbor and in doing all things with an eye single to the glory of God. As we begin this semester, may we be agents of unity. May we seek the interest of our neighbor, whether they be students, coworkers, or those within the walls of our own homes with our gaze fixed firmly on the glory of God. As we do so, we will be the peacemakers that President Russell M. Nelson said are so desperately needed in our polarized world. Quote, as Jesus, as disciples of Jesus Christ, the prophet invites, we are to be examples of how to interact with others, especially when we have differences of opinion. One of the easiest ways to identify a true follower of Jesus Christ is how compassionately that person treats other people. Let us be quick to observe the prophets of God. Friends and colleagues, I will be the first to admit that I am not always quick to observe. If you need a second witness of that fact, my wife Wendy will happily confirm it. But I want to close with two things that I have observed during my service here at BYU and in the crucible of life's experiences. First, I have observed the goodness, capacity, and consecration of the remarkable people who work at this school. 
I'm inspired by your ability to discern a need and then lift where you stand. You are not only quick to observe, you are also quick to lift up the hands that hang down and strengthen the feeble knees, to mourn with those that mourn and to comfort those that stand in need of comfort. For that, I extend my profound gratitude. Secondly and finally, in a thousand different ways I have observed and I know and testify that the restored gospel of Jesus Christ is true. Not only is it true, but it is good and beautiful and mighty to save. I know that Jesus Christ is our Savior and that this is his school, led by his living prophets and sponsored by his true and living church. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen.